do a little commercial loved ones in connection with the teachings that we're really uh, sharing in these Sunday evenings I'd uh, advocate love not the world by Watchman Nee love not the world it's called love not the world Watchman Nee and then specifically on the whole uh, business of the soul life is the release of the spirit by Nee and that's some of you may not know uh, who he is, but his uh, name is a kind of nickname, really, a watchman of Israel, you see, and that's his first name in Chinese, Ni, Watchman Ni. And I don't know how many of you know, but this is kind of the second Bible, maybe, uh, for many of us. It's called The Normal Christian Life, and uh, that's the book that most of us know him by, and then this one is really the sequel to that, uh, and it's called Release of the Spirit. And uh, that's what we will be talking about for the next two years in these evening services, and we're just starting on it, Release of the Spirit, and Normal Christian Life. And then that one is called Love Not the World. Other ones, I thought maybe I'd just clarify uh, some of the teaching and the terms for us uh, tonight. So perhaps I could just uh, point out to you that most of us, when we started with Jesus at all, most of us got all we needed from the world. And that's the position of what you might call the natural man. Uh, the body, you remember, is the outside circle, and the soul is the inner circle, and the innermost circle is the spirit. And most of us get all that we need in the way of security from the outside world, in the case of significance from the outside world, and in the case of happiness from the outside world. And that's the position of a natural man. Now, many of us became dissatisfied with that, and we saw also that that was idolatry. And we saw that we were going to end our existence after a mere 70 years, and we realized that there was a God who could give us His own life, and who was willing to forgive us for the kind of life we had lived. And so many of us have moved into, really, what is a new birth experience. We believe that God has done something in Jesus that enables us to give Him, to give us His own spirit of life, and our spirits come alive with His spirit. But we still live like that. We still continue to live getting the security and the significance and happiness that we need personally, not from the spirit of God within us, but from the outside world. And that's the position, really, of a carnal man or woman. Uh, the situation there is Romans 7 and 15. The good that I would, I cannot do, and the evil that I want to uh, avoid, the e evil that I hate, is the very thing I do. Now, that's the position of a carnal man or woman. And the reason is that the desires of the Spirit in here that they have received from Jesus are against the desires of the flesh that are coming in from outside. And so, for instance, we've often talked about Peter's situation in the courtyard, where he still depended on the opinion of men for his significance. And so when the little maid said, aren't you one of the Galileans? He was all preoccupied with what people thought of him. And he was preoccupied with what men's poor opinion could do to him. And he felt he was at the mercy of what people thought. And so even though the Spirit of Jesus from inside said, Remember, Peter, I said this moment would come, yet the desires of the Spirit to say, Yes, I am one of the Galileans, fought against the desires of the flesh, the desires for men's approval, and they prevented him doing what he would. And that's the situation that many Christians are in. They're born of the Spirit, but they still live from the world. Now, then many of us have taken another step, and we have actually not only kept the Spirit alive within us, but we have died 
to this incoming life from the world. We have decided, I am willing, Lord, to die to what the world can give me. Now, that's a big step, because that's really like going to your own funeral. It's like saying, Lord, I'm willing no longer to depend on the world for my security. I'm willing for you to take everything I have, all my food, shelter, and clothing, if you want. I'm willing to live like you, Lord Jesus, with only a stone for my pillow. I'm willing to be like that. Lord, I'm willing to die to what men think of me. I don't care if they despise me as they despised you. I don't care if they look down upon me as they look down upon you. I'm willing, Lord. I don't care what they think of me. I die to men's approval. I die, Lord, to what people can give me. I die to the happiness that they can give me. I die to whether I'm married or not married. I die to whether I have friends or not friends. I'm willing to identify myself completely with you, Lord. And we come to that place where we are saved from that incoming life of the world. But we find that our soul has got used to that incoming life of the world. And so we're a little, you remember, like Peter in the garden when the high priest's servants came to arrest Jesus. Peter really loved other people through the power of Jesus. And he really didn't hate the high priest's servant. But when he saw all these people coming to arrest his Lord, his soul was used as a big, bluff, honest, strong fisherman. His soul was used to reacting one way and one way only. And before he knew it, he had the sword out and had sliced off the ear of the high priest's servant. Now, that's soulishness. The soul is used to acting in all the time. For years, it's been depending on people for significance, other things for security, relationships for happiness. And even though you yourself have died to those things, yet you find your soul still carries on doing those things, even though you don't want to. Now, what you do find in this area is there's a freedom from willfulness. Here, the problem is the will, the selfish will. The will wants to get its own security, significance, and happiness when it wants it from the world, from things, from people. Here, it's not a case of the will. It's the case of an independent soul, a soul that has for years been trained to operate from the outside in and is just used to doing it. Here, the problem is rebellion. There's real rebellion. The good that I would, I cannot do. The evil that I hate, that's the very thing I do. I can't, I can't do it. And there's a guilt comes to our own conscience in the middle of it. Because we say to ourselves, well, I say I want to do it, but there's something in me that doesn't want to do it. I say I want to be patient with this person, but there's something in me that wants to wipe out at them. So there's a real awareness, you know, of self-will inside in the carnal person. Now, in the soulish person, there isn't that same sense of guilt. There's a sense that uh, this is not expedient, what I'm doing but it does not carry the stain of sin with it. It is inexpedient. Ah, I, I shouldn't have spoken just as loudly as I did there. No, I shouldn't have ma made that joke there. It was facetious. It wasn't the right thing to do. No, I, I shouldn't have depended on or appreciated that person's praise of me. No, that goes straight to Jesus. I hand it straight on through. So it's something that the personality does almost without thinking. It's an involuntary kind of reaction which doesn't carry guilt with it. And then, of course, the position that God wants us to come into is the spiritual position, where at last His Holy Spirit is able to pass through us to other people. And that is the position where a person is beginning to be a spiritual man or woman. A loved one's probably in that position God will continue to give us light and more light so that as you can grow in anger, you see, you can grow in anger. I mean, there are various degrees of anger. There's an anger, for instance, at uh, this stage that is just out. It just I, expresses itself outwardly. 
You're just angry as a natural man. You get angry with a person, you just wipe off at them with sarcasm or criticism. But here, as a carnal Christian, you have the power of the Holy Spirit so that the anger is seething inside, but you don't express it. But it's still there. Now, just as there are degrees of anger and degrees of sin, there are degrees of beauty and fruit of the Spirit. And so here, there is a continual, gradual improvement as the Holy Spirit refines you in the way you show patience, in the way you show love, in the way you show gentleness. And that is God's will, that we would continually be developing in the spiritual stage. Now, loved ones, those are really the four main steps in the Christian life. And why I thought I'd put them up again was, I think that you have to be very clear that unless you deal with this stage here, you're going to make no progress in this stage here. And do you see that there are many uh, Christian books that claim to deal with temperament? That is, they claim to be dealing with this soulish life, this inexpedient life. But you'll notice they'll often drift into little tricky techniques for keeping your temper. And really what they're trying to do is they're trying to suggest that temper and anger and envy and strife are not works of carnality, but are works of soulishness. Now, it isn't so. Soulishness is inexpedient personality habit that is not sinful. It is not part of the works of the flesh described in Galatians 5. It is expedient little things that you do. It is, you remember, well, one example of it was in Galatians if you like to look at it, you remember the conference that they had at Antioch over whether they should require people to become Jews before they were baptized into the Christian church. And uh, Paul talks about his relationship to Peter in that regard. Galatians 2 and verse 11. It's page 1013. Galatians 2 and verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And with him the rest of the Jews acted insincerely, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their insincerity. And really what Paul was opposing Peter for was a wrong move. He understands that, yes, Peter didn't want to offend the uh, Jews, but really it was a wrong move. It was an inexpedient move. But it was on that level. It was on the same kind of level as Paul himself discusses in 1 Corinthians 10. And it's something I'm sure that many of you have come up against in, in witnessing. 1 Corinthians 10. And it, it is, loved ones, the, yes, 1 Corinthians 10 and 23. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. And then uh, uh, in 29b, for why should my liberty be determined by another man's scruples? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? And then the parenthesis, but if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then out of consideration for the man who informed you and for conscience sake, I mean his conscience, not yours, do not eat it. It's on that level, expedience. If this ministers life to my brother or my sister, then I'll do it. If it doesn't, I'll not do it, as long as it is not a matter of sin or not sin. And that's the level 
on which we operate when we talk about soulishness. But they are inexpedient things. They are personality habits. You had a father who was very gruff, very abrupt, and you have inherited his gruffness and his abruptness. It comes over to somebody else as a lack of love. It's a personality habit that the Holy Spirit wants to begin to work on in you. And yet, loved ones, if you treat anger or jealousy as a personality habit, you will be trying to work out of yourself gradually what only God can work out in one fell swoop by being crucified with Christ. Because that's the important thing to see, that there are two senses in which we too are to experience the cross of Christ. There is this one mentioned in Romans 6 and verse 6, when it says, you remember, our old self was crucified with Christ. And there, God states very plainly how we are to enter into that. He says in Romans 6 and 11, so you also must consider yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You have to reckon. And then you remember in Romans 8 and verse 13, you have to submit yourself to the Holy Spirit. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And that is an instantaneous experience. Uh, those of you who know Greek will notice that all the verbs talked of as crucifixion there are in the aorist tense. That means it happens once. And that's what George Mueller says when he, uh, he, he records, you remember, there came a day, a day, a day, when I, George Mueller, died to self and died to sin. Now, loved ones, you can come to a place where you die to self-will. Will you die to living for what people can give you from the world? You can come to a time when you're delivered from sin, when you're delivered from the power that makes you sin, when you're delivered from having to lose your temper. There can come a time when you're delivered from that instantaneously. And most of us have taken a long time dying, but there's a time when the last breath comes and you know you're dead. And so the argument is not over, does this come gradually? Yes, maybe it comes gradually, but there comes an end to it. There comes a moment when you are crucified with Christ. Now, that deals with the old self and the self-will. On the other hand, soulishness is dealt with through the cross that is talked about in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Luke 9 and 23. And it is not looked upon as a once-for-all instantaneous experience. But you see, really, it's talked about in the very opposite way. Luke 9 and verse 23. And he said to all, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about soulishness. We're talking about the daily cross that is born daily and continually throughout our lives. And that is entered into in the same way, really. Trust and obey is always the answer to everything that God does among us. And it is belief and obedience. But here it is belief as to what the Word of God shows you, and it is submission to the breaking experiences that God brings you. And loved ones, this is a continual bearing of the cross, and this is a once and for all. And that's why I think some of you loved ones, you know, say, well, now, brother, isn't it, I mean, isn't it a daily cross? Well, it's a daily cross if you've experienced the once and for all cross. But if you've never experienced dying to your self-will and to your rights and to your right to your own way, if you've never identified yourself totally with Jesus and been willing at last to accept from God all that you need, then you'll never be able to experience this daily cross. Now, there are some loved ones that are uh, writing books on temperament, uh, and they're trying to somehow deal with anger and envy and jealousy as if it was a temperament problem. Now, that's not a temperament problem. That's a temper problem and a sin problem. But when you're dealing with facetiousness, 
or you're dealing maybe with a mind that is sluggish, or you're dealing with a personality that has become abrupt due to the influence of your dad or your mum, or you're dealing with things that the psychologists would say are personality traits, then we're dealing with soulishness. But it is important, brothers and sisters, to, to make a clear distinction. Uh, I found that it was good for me to be very straight with myself. All right, is anger sin? Okay, let me call it sin. Let me not call it a personality shortcoming, a personality weakness. And uh, is selfishness sin? All right, let me call it sin. Let me not call it some trait that I've inherited from my father or mother. I've inherited it straight from hell, straight from Satan himself. And it was good to identify clearly the works of the flesh. And y you might like to do that there, Galatians and chapter 5. And just... Keep calling them sin, loved ones, because they are sin, and it's sin that God deals with in the once and for all crucifixion with Christ. It's S and the I and the N. It's the I. Galatians 5 and verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are plain. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, and that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, those things are sin. Those are just plain, downright sin. That's cancer. You may say, oh, can't I eat more and grow out of the cancer? No, you eat more and the cancer grows more with you. You don't eat more and grow more and get more power to get rid of cancer, you have cancer cut out by the circumcision of the heart which the Holy Spirit works in you when He cleanses you by faith as you're willing to be identified with Christ. But it is a once and for all experience, and yet it's an experience that you have to walk in daily. And of course, as you begin to walk into it, then the Holy Spirit begins to re reveal your soulishness to you. Now, loved ones, if you say to me, well, what happens if we stop, if you wouldn't mind me being a miserable math ma mathematician, uh, what happens if you stop at number two? Oh, I think many loved ones who are baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit stop at number two, and they feel their personality is something that is precious and something that they ought not to allow God to tamper with. And so they get proud and possessive of their, self, of their personality, and it dominates them, and it begins to actually destroy the outgoing movement of the Holy Spirit within them. And eventually then they fall back into self. And of course, from there they can fall really right to the bottom if they keep ignoring Jesus and keep ignoring the Holy Spirit. So many of us who do not go on to number three and unto freedom from soulishness fall back into self. That's why even in, in churches that, where there is a real teaching of being filled with the Holy Spirit, you can still find people having difficulty getting on with each other. That's why you, would have, you could have several roommates who are filled with the Holy Spirit and have really uh, been crucified with Christ, and it's not the sinful things that they do that offend each other. It's uh, drinking their soup noisily that offends them. Or it's leaving the dirty socks continually in the same corner. It's things that they have got used to doing that are not placarded in the Bible as sin and do not come home to them with the guilt of sin, but they are just inexpedient human traits. Yet they continue to niggle and cause friction with the roommates until really it is like hell instead of heaven. And yet they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, they won't remain long, of course, that way because the Holy Spirit is continually showing them these things and revealing to them how they're not ministering life to each other. And this is what number three is concerned with. This is, number one and two is concerned with your salvation. But number three is concerned with your ministry of life to other people. And that's why you talk there about inexpedience and expedience. And there are many of us who are filled with the Holy Spirit, but when people meet us, that's who they meet. They meet us, us, our personalities with all their idiosyncrasies and all their strange little ways, and the people are faced with us, not with Jesus. 
And that's uh, why Paul wrote about this daily bearing of the cross in 2 Corinthians 5, it is. 2 Corinthians 5. I'm sorry, it's 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 10. And uh, Paul mentions this in connection with not our own salvation, but ministry. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So you see, it's for the purpose of manifesting the life of Jesus out through our personalities. And unless you let the mighty powers of your soul be broken and be redirected by the Holy Spirit, you'll never minister life to people. One example of this would be when someone comes to you and asks you about the creation of the world and begins to discuss the evolutionary theory with you. And you have just absorbed all of Henry Morris's uh, tapes and you've read all the books in the library on evolution and you just want them with it. And the poor soul kind of backs off as you hit him with argument after argument after argument, but your brilliant intellectual personality knows no stopping and just mows on through. <laughs> and the poor soul's eyes get glazed, and then he, boy, he never asks you another question. In fact, he avoids you. Now, that's, that's soulishness. That's inexpedience. That's a failure to minister life. You minister a lot of knowledge, but you don't minister life. And it's the same with those of us who are particularly emotional people, as I shared with you before. Some of us are very, very warm in our affections. We just are naturally, either we're naturally very warm in our affections, or we had trouble because our moms and dads didn't give us enough love when we were young. And so we are very affectionate people. And we, somebody comes to us and asks us uh, where we go to church and that kind of thing, and we smother them with love with human love, and they feel they're being suffocated, and they feel that they're not being given a chance to deal with God, they're being suffocated by your personality, and they begin to back off and fear that this is going to be too claustrophobic a relationship. Now, that's you ministering emotion, uh, love, you see, but it's human love and emotional love to the person. And of course, it's stemming from your soul. It's stemming from your soul. It's not coming from your spirit. Now, if you press me and say, oh, do you mean that Jesus would not express love in that warm way? You've only to look at Jesus weeping over Jerusalem to see tears in his eyes when he hears that Lazarus has died, to know that, of course, Jesus expresses love and sympathy and sadness and weeps with those who weep and rejoices with those who rejoice, but it's under the control of his spirit. It, isn't, it has nothing of selfishness in it. And so often, our soulish love has selfishness in it. We feel, well, quid pro quo, if we give them a little love, maybe they'll give us a little love back. And it's the soul just going on its usual old way of exchanging love for love. Maybe it's not even that you're conscious of it. Maybe you're not even aware that you're seeking love. But your soul is used to it for so long, over so many years, that it automatically does it. Now, that's what we're talking about, loved ones, when we're talking about soulishness. Now, what I'd just like to do very briefly is to point out to you the four times when Jesus talks about bearing the daily cross in regard to our soul life. And you remember we dealt with some of them, so I shall just go fairly quickly through them. The first one the first time, and Jesus does talk about the soul, you see, when he, when he uh, makes these statements. The first one is in Matthew 10. Matthew 10, verse 